This is Sunny Harris. It says Futures Trading 101 for chat with traders. I'm Sunny Harris, PhD in mathematics. Oh, and, and I also have a little degree in uh, photography. Just a quick note for uh, all our listeners. Uh, any questions that you have, please ask them uh, verbally if you'd like on the fly. You don't have to wait uh, until a particular time. Uh, or you can type them in the, the chat um, box there and Sonny will be monitoring that as well. So uh, welcome, Sonny, to another uh, Chat Thank with you. Traders community presentation. Uh, Sonny has been uh, uh, has presented with us in the past and has also been a guest on the podcast. So welcome back and let's dive into futures. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate it. And Tessa. So I do prefer that you interact with me. I would love to answer questions on the fly. I don't know what you don't know. Uh, I do know what I know. And if you ask questions, it'll help me uh, give you more answers. So my passion, besides trading, of course, is in helping traders. I like to talk to people who have not yet become wildly successful, people who have not traded much and want to learn, and people who want to improve their trading results. I get a lot of calls from people who say, uh, I've blown out three accounts so far and I need help. I like to help those people. So this is for beginners and intermediates of all types. Yeah, people call saying they, they're digging themselves into a hole. How can I help them get out? And I love to do that. First, the uh, required disclaimers. Past performance is not a predictor of future results. All investing involves risk of loss. And the examples provided herein may not be representative of typical results. You can and may lose some or all of your money. And so never risk more than you can afford to lose. I have the uh, full disclosures and details on my website, and I will be posting these slides to moneymentor.com, which is my website. And you can click on the link and go right there. This talk is for educational purposes only. And this is the big disclaimer that you have to read uh, and you can read it on my website in, in total. So I, I guess, uh, how often are we thinking about repeating this Futures 101 or continuing Futures 101 guys? Tessa and Ian, monthly, weekly? Um, I, I would think uh, probably monthly would be okay. uh, would be sufficient. Yeah. Cool. So with enough interest, we will continue to do it monthly. I'm going to start with definitions and explanations because not everybody knows what futures are. I mean, a lot of people tell me, oh, I can trade stocks, but I'm really afraid of trading futures. So I'm here to dispel that and to tell you what futures actually mean. And then we will progress into futures trading examples and real life examples. I am a professional trader. I've been trading for more than 42 years now. I trade futures, stocks, and crypto, although I've also traded all kinds of things, bonds and municipal bonds and corporate bonds and lots of trading of houses and just gold and all kinds of things. But I don't trade options. I don't trade options because I used to trade options and I found out very quickly that though I could predict the direction of the market really well, I couldn't make money in options. They were always expiring worthless. So I don't do that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, but I'm going to first let, I'm going to show you how I trade. This is today. Now it looks pretty obvious what to do today. But I like to add some of my indicators. Now, I've written indicators. I'm a programmer, too. And I've written indicators for the things that make my trading life easier. So the first one I put on any chart is that. Do you see the difference in the chart? The blue and magenta bars are the night session, and the red and green bars, candles, are the day session. So see that? And then that makes it much easier for me to trade that way. The next thing I do is I put on sunny bands. So this is an indicator that I 
have been using for the last 36 years with no changes. No inputs, no optimization, no changes. It just keeps working. So I will explain that to you in a little while, but that's my uh, flagship indicator, sunny bands. And it tells me exactly when to go long and when to go short. <clears throat> then I add one more indicator. I, I call it the DMAH, which stands for Dynamic Moving Average Histogram. And I'll explain the, the math of that next time we meet and talk about how that works. But today I'm just gonna talk about what futures mean. Here we have a few quips. I call them quips and quotes. Uh, one of my clients, Aaron, said you can use sunny bands for options on the QQQ. When it goes purple, I go. Let me show you what that means real quick. You see, you see my mouse? Right here, we've got the gold line of the dynamic moving average on top. And right back here, we have the purple line of the dynamic moving average on top. So when it's purple, the market's overall bearish. When it's gold, it's overall bullish. So he says it's a sure bet. Price crosses over the lower outer band sometimes, but I wait for a couple of bars within the lower outer band, and I catch it on Friday on options. Expert. He uses uh, weekly options. So when it don't inspire on Friday, he sells puts, and it's a sure thing. So what does he mean by that? Well, here's a picture of Sunny Bands where you can say, see purple on top over here, gold on top here, purple on top here. And if you have any questions about that, just ask them. I'll explain more. So with purple on top, the environment is largely bearish. When gold's on top, the environment is largely bullish. So. Um, the dynamic moving average is what I first started trading with many. Well, I started 42 years ago. It took me 18 months to develop it and get the math right on it. Uh, but it's too slow for me now. So I use the sunny bands for all my signals and I'll show you later how those work. I'm not gonna go back on this one. Here's another quip from Don. Nice bands. This morning I did a couple of MES buys and sells, and then I bought into an upward moving ES, which was signaled by the DMA histogram. I followed it to the top sunny band. I closed. I sold short of the top sunny band. I followed it to the bottom. A $4,000 account, which is what he'd moved into his future account, returned $2,000. It doesn't get any better than that. That's one day. He, uh, what's that? 50% of his account in one day. Here's another one. Oh, I do give free trials of my indicators for people who have multi-charts, trade station, or ninja. I give you a free seven-day trial. So, and with that, I give a lot of instruction, usually three Zoom calls where, where I work uh, through the live market and show you what I would be doing. He made 5,772 on the first day of his free trial. It told me exactly where the turns were, even with the high volatility. You're one of the few people that allows test drives. It's nothing short of amazing. So I am a professional trader, which means I have to pay for professional fees. I've been trading since 1981. I've seen a number of crashes, 1987, 2000, 2008, and I've manage to weather all those crashes and not only weather them to profit from them. And of course, as well as the 38% COVID crash. I trade the S&P 500 futures contract and I'm gonna explain what that is in just a little bit. <clears throat> I usually trade on one and five minute charts. I've been doing it the whole time. The S&P came into existence in 1982 while I was still finishing up my research. And so I've been doing it an entire time. I do have long-term stock holdings. I have a separate portfolio for my stocks. And I, I call long-term a week or more, because if you're looking at a five-minute chart, then long-term is a week. In fact, a daily chart is, is a long, long-term chart to me. And I do trade cryptocurrencies. 
So today I'm gonna to talk about futures. What's the difference between futures and commodities and equities? It's partly semantic. Um, they all go up, they all go down and they all go sideways. I call those bull markets, bear markets and chicken markets. So when they're going sideways, that's a chicken market to me. In fact, on my, on my first book, Trading 101, they drew, the, the artist did the cover, drew a bunch of bulls and bears. So on Trading 102, I told them, put some chickens in there too, because there's bull markets, bear markets, and chicken markets. So you'll notice a little chicken in the cover of Trading 102. Commodities are very highly related to futures contracts. Commodities are things you can buy and sell. They're a basic good use in commerce that's interchangeable with goods at the same time. For instance, gold, grains, beef, oil, natural gas, those kind of things are commodities. You can physically hold them and you can see them. And people who, let me go back a little bit. People who trade commodities are not only people like us retail traders who want to buy and sell, hoping they'll go up or down, <clears throat> but farmers, people with uh, grain silos, people with, who are, have enormous cattle ranches. These people are also trading commodities, but the commodity they're selling is a thousand head of cattle or a ton of grains or things like that, things that go out on big boats and big trucks. There's also something called a forward contract. So a forward contract can be written for any commodity for any amount or delivery time. So if you're a farmer, you might say that you want to write a, uh, Farmer Joe will write a contract with Farmer Bob. And if, so one of them is selling cattle and one of them is selling grain. And they're gonna be writing those contracts for whatever amount they have for sale at whatever delivery time they want. In the case of futures contracts, though, it's standardized in an exchange as to grade, quantity, and delivery month. There's no exchange on the forward contracts, but in the futures contracts, there's an exchange. <clears throat> a cash contract is a financial agreement at which one party agrees to purchase a specified quantity of a commodity on a predetermined date. So that's Farmer Joe and Farmer Bob again. <laughs> And they're agreeing on a price in advance for a certain number of whatever it is that they're selling and a date at which they are actually going to redeem that contract. Futures contracts often close out their contract for cash prior to the delivery date. So the buyer in a cash contract always intends to take physical delivery of the com commodity. But a futures trader like me it's going to be, and I go in and out every day. So I'm not waiting for three months from now to cash out. I'm cashing out every day. A cash contract is common among industrial customers. So they, they're relying on commodities for their production processes. So futures contracts, however, are used by speculators or traders or people who wish to hedge their risks or speculate on price movements, and that's us. We have a We're question. Like, yeah, um, yeah, we have a question from Tan. Uh, I heard orange juice futures are always fun when Florida or California gets snow. Lots of volatility during weather storms. Uh, do you trade orange juice? I don't trade orange juice. No, I oh. don't. But it's a, that's a good idea. This is the mm -hmm. cyclical nature of, and the fundamental nature of a futures contract. So mm -hmm. orange juice, I, I always say don't buy something you can't sell. Orange juice is thinly traded. Mm -hmm. That means there's not a whole lot of people on the other side of the trade you might want to initiate. So if, if and lumber like, uh, <clears throat> lumber's the worst. Hmm. In the lumber pit, there's only two people. In the S&P 500 futures pit, there's a hundred people. So why why is our, are there so few people in the lumber pit when lumber is such an important commodity for uh, the housing industry? 
because they're trading lumber on cash contracts instead of futures contracts. Oh, okay. Uh, great to know didn't realize the lumber is thin. Yeah. Yeah. And they're thinly traded. So I only trade, and I'm going to show you a page out of Stocks and Commodities magazine in a few minutes that shows you why I trade the S&P and nothing else. Uh, you know, I've traded gold. I've traded bonds. I don't like to trade bonds because it means I have to be at my desk at 520 in the morning in California. And I don't love that. As it is, I get up at 445 every morning to be down here by 630. I don't like that either. <laughs> But, you know, I'm used to it. After 42 years, I'm used to it. But I don't like the 520. It's just, it's an hour too early. Examples of commodities, corn, crude oil, butter. There are butter futures, sugar futures, cocoa, cotton, hogs, live cattle, lots and lots of different commodities. Derivatives are futures contracts, but they are derived from the underlying assets. So, with the S&P 500, there is no physical commodity. It, it's a futures contract, but there's no physical commodity. The derived, the underlying asset is 500 shares, one share of 500 different stocks. So the one share of 500 stocks, and they call it the S&P 500. And the value is derived from that one share of 500 stocks. But basically you're betting at this level on it going up or down. And these are called financial futures. There's no physical, it's not like gold where you can get coins. You don't take delivery of one share each of 500 stocks. So the S&P 500, the NASDAQ and the Dow which has a futures contract starts with YM. These are all financial futures. So you're really just wagering on the fact that it's going to go up or going to go down, depending on your opinion, what you think is going to happen next. And futures originally meant something that had a potential value in the future that could be more than its current value. Uh, there was something called the buttonwood tree back in ancient times, like 200 years ago. And they would, the farmers would all meet at this buttonwood tree on a certain day of the year, certain day of the month, week, excuse me. And uh, they would post notes, uh, take a note and hammer it in with a nail about what they had to buy or sell. And that's how trading started. They were buying and selling according to these notes. And sometimes, uh, Farmer Joe would want to sell his wheat and Farmer Bob would want to buy some cattle. And then they had to find somebody else who wants to post another note right on top of their note telling them, yes, I'll take that contract. <clears throat> a futures contract is a standardized forward contract. Okay, so it's standardized means it expires on a certain predetermined date. It has a certain value. And uh, it's ruled by or carried by an exchange. It can be broken by either party with an offsetting transaction. So if I want to get out of my futures contract, basically I'm trying to find uh, a buyer who will buy it from me. And that's what the exchange takes care of is matching buyers and sellers. Let's talk for a second about short versus long. Who does not know what short versus short means or long means? Can I explain that or does everybody understand that? Can I get a little commentary here? Does anybody understand what short means? Yes, we um, I understand. All right. So everybody understands short. So if Farmer Joe wants to sell his corn to Farmer Bill so he can buy a tractor now, he sells it now at a price he estimates for future delivery in, let's say, three months, because that's pretty standard. Joe hopes the price of corn goes down and he has sold at a better price, but Bill's hoping the price goes up and he got a good deal. So you're one of you thinks it's going to go up and the other one thinks it's going to go down and you, you sold at a better price than it's going to eventually arrive at. <clears throat> 
So basically, when you buy a futures contract, you hope the price will go up. And when you sell a futures contract, you hope the price will go down. A lot of people really don't get the how, how you can sell something before you buy it. But that's how short works. You're selling something before you buy it back, but you're, you're promising to buy it back. So even if it goes up, you still have to buy it back. And that's called shorting. You sell it now on the promise of buying it back at a later date. There's a short trade. Everybody gets that. So if you sell up here at the top of this and you ride it all the way down like this, then you make however many points are from there to there. Futures trading is a zero sum game. That means for every buyer, there must be a seller. And for every seller, there must be a buyer. And the exchange matches those buyers and sellers up very fast, and especially now that it's all electronic. When I, when I first started trading, there was no electronic exchange. I uh, would call the floor. I don't even know if anybody knows what the floor of the exchange is anymore. But there'd be 100 guys standing around the S&P pit and a bunch of guys on the outside of the pit screaming and yelling and waving their hands and flashing signals to buy or sell in certain quantities. <clears throat> so I had two traders on the floor and I would call them up and tell them, hi, this is Sunny, buy 20, S and buy, buy 20 front month. And they knew that it was S&P because I was calling the S&P pit and they knew who I was because they later told me that I was the only woman calling the floor. So also for every seller, there must be a buyer. That's what we mean by a zero sum game. There's, there's somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna lose. There must be a buyer for every seller. Futures contracts expire. The length of a contract is usually three months. There are other contracts that expire every month and there are some that expire every other month. But then the ones I trade, the S&P, it's every three months. So at the end of the three months, the contract expires. It used to be that the holder of the contract would take delivery. So that means if you're holding a thousand head of cattle in your futures contract, be looking at the door because there's going to be a thousand head of cattle coming down your street. Now, I think uh, for the most part, you get cashed out. You don't take delivery of the cattle or the corn or whatever anymore, shrimp. <laughs> so now if you let it go to expiration, they will put the cash in your account. So it will be credited or debited the amount of your gain or loss. So if you let it expire worthless and, or not worthless, but in a negative position, then that loss will get posted to your account. If you let it expire in a positive position, the gain will be, get posted to your account. <clears throat> Typically, though, we roll over the contract rather than let it expire. So, for instance, when the September contract is about to expire, then you roll into the December contract and you, you can still hold it if you want to, but now you're holding a different contract. Let's talk for a second about rollover versus expiration. So here's a calendar of the September this year. And the way it used to be, well, so expiration is on the third Friday of the month. So one, two, three Fridays, and the 15th is the expiration of the September contract. Rollover used to be the Thursday of the week prior. So not the third Thursday. See, that's just, just the first Thursday. But it was the Thursday of the week prior to the third Friday. <clears throat> Now, starting this year, they've got rollovers, I mean, uh, expiration still on Friday the 15th, but Monday of the same week is now the rollover. And by rollover, I mean that the people in the pit uh, and the professional traders are all trading <laughs> the December contract on that day. So I don't let it go past that first, that Monday. When that Monday comes, 
I sell out of whatever I'm holding and I buy into the next expiration month. So that's called rollover. I have you up here because this is the symbol for September. They have letter codes for each month that things expire. And so September is you. And I'm going to show you how to construct symbols in just a minute. So here we have them. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, etc. Every month has a code. And you see March, H. So I memorized it. 100 years ago, I memorized HMUZ. March is H. June is M. September is U. December is Z. Those are the four months that uh, the S&P contract expires. HMUZ. To construct a future symbol, we take the symbol. So in the case of the Dow, it was YM. In the case of the NASDAQ, it was NQ. In the case of the S&P, it's ES for the E-mini contract or MES for the micro contract. So you take the symbol plus the expiration month code, HMU or Z, plus the year expressed as two digits. So... ESM23 is the June contract of the E mini in 2023. And that's the contract I'm trading right now. ESM23. <clears throat> GC is for gold. M is again for June and 23 the year. So that's the gold futures contract for June. Let's talk about. We just said that. We don't need to say that again. Commodities are an important aspect of your lives. Commodities are basic goods. And you trade them with futures contracts. You don't have, there's no such thing as a commodity contract. The commodities have futures contracts. And I said that in the beginning, don't buy something you can't sell. That's why I, I don't trade thin markets. So I want you to be aware of the liquidity of whatever it is you want to trade and check the magazine, Technical Analysis of Stocks and Commodities. Sometimes we call it TASC, T-A-S-C. Sometimes we just call it Stocks and Commodities, but that's the, mag that's the important magazine for traders. They, every month in the back of the magazine, they put a futures liquidity table. It's always in the back. And that's what it looks like. Now, this is too small to see, but you, but right up here at the very top, the exchange is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME. Here's the margin for that contract. And you can see that this dotted lines or stars, I think they are, go all the way out to the end of the page. And then they have greater than, greater than, greater than, because it really goes way out over to here and they can't print it on that magazine. But you can see as you go down in the liquidity table, these things become more and more thin. So here, see, there's just very little trading going on down here. So you want to stay so you can buy and sell quickly and easily, and you find one buyer for every seller. You want to stay in the things that are right at the top of this liquidity table. Question. Uh, yeah. So for the commodities that are further down the chart, uh, how like what would be considered a large size position that would encounter difficulties getting in or out of that position? So for a very small trader, could they say, well, could I get into some of these um, uh, commodities down the list because I'm trading a very small position? You could get in, but you might not be able to get out. So uh, holding my magnifying glass up to this, I can see that the first contract is the S&P, then the 10-year T-note, then the ultra T-bond contract, the five-year T-note. We've got a lot of T-notes and bonds up here. And then down at this level, we have crude oil. Then the time to go to the gym. I got to leave. Then we've got two-year T-notes, the Russell 2000, which is down, see where it is in the liquidity table. We're already down to this amount of liquidity when you get into the Russell. And then we've got the NASDAQ 100, which is the NQ contract. And where's that? NASDAQ's down in here. You see, it's not as, li as liquid. 
as the S and P. But, so, but say, say for a, a, a trader that is say has twenty five thousand dollars to work with, mm -hmm. uh, would would they be able to get into the Nasdaq or something further down the list, get in and get out because they're saying, hey, I'm only trading twenty five thousand. Surely there should be enough liquidity for me to get in and get out easily, right? Because because my size is so small. Or how does that work? Well, you can get in and get out, but the problem comes when at, with the price that you get in and out at you're likely to get split fills or fills at a different price than was showing on your screen when you entered the order. With the S&P 500, you can get in and out with very little slippage. I mean, sometimes I get no slippage, sometimes I get a tick. But unless the market's moving very, very fast in one direction or the other, uh, I, get, I get filled at the price I was expecting to get filled at. In the NASDAQ, that's not the case. You get split fills, which means if you're trading two contracts, one might be filled at 100 and the other filled at 101. I don't like split fills. It makes my bet bookkeeping difficult. And I don't like it because I get slippage. So I don't get filled at the price I wanted to get filled at. So it, actually the margin, we're going to discuss margin in just a minute, but the margin on the NASDAQ is higher than the margin on the S&P. So if you've got 25 grand, why not trade one S&P? I mean, that's enough to trade one S&P. If you trade, uh, I know that if you trade more than 20 contracts at a time, you're likely, I've had this happen, you're likely to get split fills. <clears throat> 20, 20 at a time will make the market take note. Whereas one, two, five, nobody notices. They're just instantly filled. Let's see what else is down here. We've got copper down at, at this. Uh-oh. We've got copper down at this level, gold, gasoline, wheat. See, they're, uh, these contracts are all thinly traded. Uh, so if you had 25,000 and wanted to trade more contracts than that, you could trade the micro the E-mini micro. So that's uh, 10 contracts of the micro for every one contract of the E-mini. So do those other uh, markets below uh, exist primarily for people who are taking physical delivery uh, and are not that suitable for uh, regular day traders? Well, I had a client, I, had, I was giving a seminar. I forgot, they're not called webinars back then. I was giving a seminar in-person seminar and i had one guy in there who grew soybeans and corn and so he wanted to hedge his soybeans by trading so he would offer the contracts to say the the uh, cash contracts for sale and then hedge his bets with the futures trading so that's what a lot of these people are doing in these thinly traded things they're hedging their actual commodity bets uh, the people who are just in it for speculating are up near the top. Okay. So we've got the E-mini, which is ES, soybean oil, BO, <laughs> British pound is BP, the CMA Bitcoin contract is BTC, corn is C, crude oil is CL, and the dollar index is DX. And I cover several of these in my Sunday night, sunny side of the street newsletter. Now let's talk about margin for a minute. Margin is the dollar amount that you have to put up to control that contract. So if you want to uh, buy an E-mini contract, you have to put up this amount of margin. For instance, with a house, you put up a down payment. Right. So if you want to buy a million dollar house in California, you have to put down 20 percent. Two hundred thousand dollars. To control one S&P contract, though, you need to put up the margin, which is twelve thousand three hundred and twenty at the moment. Question. Uh, how often do uh, margin requirements change uh, over time? And does it vary with the instrument that you're trading? I mean, we've some of us have heard about uh the Hunt brothers trying to corner the market in silver, silver market. in 1980, mm -hmm. and then they raised the mar supposedly raised the margin requirements on them to such a level where uh, they were essentially forced out of their position. Yeah, How often do you see? They got squeezed. 
Yeah. How often do you see margin uh, uh, margin requirements changing? The margin requirements change with volatility, and that does depend on the market that you're looking at. So I'm going to show you in just a second a program that I have uh, from Chris Davey that uh, ca that posts the margin right on right on a screen on Trade Station uh, margin for every contract. The margin last year was eleven thousand six hundred. Now it's twelve thousand three twenty. It changes based on volatility, not based on time. So to be certain that I don't don't go under that margin amount and get a margin call, I post double that amount for each contract I trade. So twenty five thousand dollars approximately is one S and P contract for me. That's how I trade it. If you get a margin call, which means you go under that twelve thousand three hundred and twenty, even by a dollar the the broker will call you and give you an email to tell you you've got 24 hours to bring it up above margin and you got to get money in there fast it's kind of a scary thing i had it happen once and you don't want to be instantly having to come up with that extra money so i doubled the contract amount and how much does um one contract s p contract represent how much total value does that represent? So to figure how leveraged would you be if you had the minimum 12320 I'm glad you asked. Watch this. I'm going to tell you just exactly. So the S&P 500 is a stock market index. Okay, It's not a commodity. It's tracking the stock performance of 500 of the largest companies listed on the stock exchanges. So the price yesterday when I put this together was 4,169.48. 500 shares times that is 2,098,000. So one S&P contract is really worth $2 million. And the margin is 12,320. So you're putting up 0.6% margin. Not the 20% you have to put up for a house, but 0.6. So it's highly leveraged. That's why people say you can lose all that you put in because at 0.6% margin, it can move pretty fast sometimes. Does that answer it, Ian? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Just happen to have that slide. Mm -hmm. So I do have an app for that, C21 Futures Margin. And uh, if you want to give me a call or send me, shoot me an email, I can refer you to Chris Davey, who wrote this. And that's the screen as it shows on TradeStation. And you can see... These are all alphabetical, 10-year yield, two-year yield, 30-year yield. We hear soy. And so soy, for instance, soybean oil is uh, 2530. The British pound is 1540. Bitcoin futures are 44,000 margin. Uh, where's the ES? It's not on this one. It's probably on the next one. But you can see these thinly traded contracts have lower margin. Canadian dollar, only $757 for the margin. Yeah, there's more. So here we have the dollar index. There's the E-mini S&P. Margin is 12320 but these charts, none of these charts give us an indication of how leveraged you would be if you had the minimum margin. No. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. Because there's no price in here. You see, it doesn't say 4,000, whatever oh, got the it. price is. I'm, I'm trying to get him to put one more thing in here, and that's the expiration month codes. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see this say HMUZ or FHMQ or whatever the codes are for those months um do we have the mes it doesn't go down as far as the mes but the the mes which is the micro e-mini the margin for that is let's see where's the e-mini s p is 12,320 and so a tenth of that is 1,232 and that's the margin on the micro contract 12,132 it essentially moves the same as the E-mini. It's posting basically the same numbers, only it's a tenth of the size. And it is a little bit less liquid. 
it does have fewer contracts being traded of it. So if you were to trade five contracts of the MES, for instance, you'd be trading half of an E-mini. <clears throat> so there's the E-mini. And then I'm gonna close with telling you a little bit more of my story. I grew up dirt poor in Appalachia and realized that education was the only way out. So I got overeducated. I've been programming for 54 years. I've been trading for 42 years. I went it was initially a systems programmer for Lockheed. I founded a little company with some friends called ISCO. We were the world's leader in computer graphics software. I sold my share of the company and retired when I was 30. And I gave my millions to money managers, which I thought was the smart thing to do because I knew nothing about trading. I knew nothing about investing. I didn't know anything about economics. And they lost $75,000 in three weeks. And I thought, okay, 52 weeks divided by three, they could lose a whole lot before the year's out. So I decided I could do that poorly on my own. And I taught myself to trade through reading books related to the markets and economics and all that other stuff. And you can see my bookshelf behind me. I've now read 746 books on the subject and I keep reading. I, just, I read and read and read. It's my, it's my relaxation. And I didn't enter a single real trade in the market for the first year. I wrote them down. We didn't even have Excel back then. So I was writing them on down and keeping track of what we would now call simulated trading. But I was watching and learning how the markets moved. Uh, I published a monthly magazine called Traders Rat Catalog and Resource Guide for eight years, magazine for traders. And then when we got the internet, I decided that paper magazines were going to be out. So I quit publishing that and started my website, moneymentor.com. I've written five best-selling books on trading, and there they are real quick. And then I wrote one that's not about trading with my friend Linda Blair, the actress, mm -hmm. called Going Vegan. And now I am almost, thank goodness, finally done with a definitive guide to trade stations, easy language, and OOEL programming with my Friend Sam Tennis, who is the originator of Trade Station and Easy Language. I've written articles for all the major magazines. And there's the covers of my books. Oh, and I ghost wrote uh, Using Easy Language 9.x for Murray Ruggiero. And um, here's the new one. I changed the title though. Uh, if you want to read quips and quotes and see what my clients and wannabe clients say, it's on moneymentor.com under pull down quips. I have customers just about everywhere. I've got a new one in Rwanda. I've always wanted to go to Rwanda, so I think I know where I'm go who I'm going to go visit. Mm -hmm. I want to go uh, hike with up to the gorillas, see the gorillas. So next time I'm going to show you futures trading the way I do it, how to make a six-figure income, actual futures trading examples, and I'm going to give you a preview here. Here's how to make a six-figure income. If you want to make $120,000 a year, that seems like a lot. That seems like, well, I can't make that much. I can only make $10,000 a year. Well, if you break it down into steps, you can do it. $120,000 a year divided by 12 months is ten grand a month. Now that still seems kind of impossible. So let's break that down into 20 trading days. That's $500 a day. That seems more possible. But let's break it down again. That's only five trades at $100 each. That's doable. So if you set your goals in steps like this, you can do it. You just have to have measurable goals. And in the S&P 500, there's usually between $1,000 and $3,500 per day, going both long and short, just one contract. So that's it for today. Don't hesitate to call me or Skype me. My cell phone is out here for everyone to see. It's right on the top of my website. 
I am in California, so don't wake me up too early. And you can always send me an email, sunny at moneymentor.com. And my website is www.moneymentor.com. Do we have any more questions or has this been all too elementary for everybody? Uh, yeah, one quick question. Is the number one benefit to trading S&P futures is that you get a, a whole lot more leverage available to you than just trading the ticker symbol SPY uh, and limiting yourself to two times or four times leverage on that uh, for yes. day trading? Right. Okay. Yeah, the S SPY virtually moves the same. Mm -hmm. There's just no money in it. And there's only one reason to trade, and that's to make money. I mean, yes, if you trade the SPY, you can also lose less. But that's not the reason to trade, to limit your losses. The reason to trade is to make money. If you're trading for any other reason, you need to do something else. <clears throat> I have a question, Sunny. Uh, this is Tessa. So I, I noticed that um, it's very similar uh, to options in some ways. Um, <laughs> futures contract, not very, I mean, some of the things, some aspects of it are similar to trading options. Um, would you say that, uh, would it be easier to transition from trading stocks to futures or from options to futures? Mm, I don't know. Um, I started out trading stocks. I tried my hand at options because it was real easy for me to figure out all the equations. That was no problem. And I thought, well, because I understand the equations and I've put them all on a spreadsheet, I must be able to trade options. But I think from what I hear, the key to trading options is spreads. So you're kind of limiting your profit, but you're guaranteeing a profit at the same time. So... Futures are, I'm not worried about the expiration. I'm not worried about the time decay. I'm not worried about doing spreads. I just have to buy or sell. It's much simpler. So I buy if I think it's going up and I sell if I think it's going down. So I think it's six of one there. It's just as easy to transfer from stocks to futures as it is from options to futures. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Sunny? I just have a quick one. Um, Sunny, I'm yes, a book yeah. level as well. As you can see, I have books behind me. Trading oh, books. Oh, wonderful. Well. Wonderful. I just have a question. How do you organize a library? Or like, how do you keep track of what you've read? Because I'm getting to the point where I'm rereading books that I re reread it and I can't keep track of that. Yeah, I have a database. Oh, okay. I have a database where I keep track not only of all my trading books, but all of my fun books, all the novels I read. I keep track of everything I read. I write a little review for myself. I write, put in there the publication date, the author's names, uh, the, a picture of the cover, and the date I read it. Oh, wow. Have you thought about selling your books to us newbies? Um, I'm, I'm willing to learn more, so I can take them off your hands and you can buy more books and have more space. <laughs> I, am, I am very proud of my extensive trading library. There's no way I'm ever selling it. Okay. Maybe after I die, you can contact my family. <laughs> Let's hope not. I know. Yeah, but no, I just know it's a, it's a wonderful collection and there's no way that I'm going to get rid of it in any way. Thank you, Sonny. And I do refer to them from time to time. I'll think, you know, I read something or other in such and such a book. I'm going to look that up. And I don't I don't have any of my trading books on my Kindle. Oh. I have my novels on my Kindle. And and I have the Kindle app on my phone, so I take my phone everywhere and if I've got an extra 5 minutes I read. But I don't have any of my trading books on my Kindle. Thank you for the advice about the database. I think I'm going to start one now. Yeah. I mean, even if you just kept an Excel spreadsheet, that's better than forgetting what you read. True. Yeah. Thank Microsoft you. Access. <laughs> Thank you for that question. That's a good one. Anybody else? Yeah. Sunny, um, is, there any, is there any book what you can say that blow your mind 
in your early stage uh, that you say, well, this is something what you must read? Any of Larry Williams's books. Yeah, Larry not not the, not the normal books. What what everyone maybe uh, have read. So someone was um, uh, not not on the radar from every trader. So uh, some hidden book. So where we mm. don't know. No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is one. Um, mm, gosh, what is the name of it? Look in your database. <laughs> that's a very good question uh suggestion um there's a book by dick stolkin and he tells you when to buy futures when to buy commodities when to buy bonds and when to buy stocks to pay it depending on the financial cycle that is not well known and it's extremely important to read dick stolkin Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good advice. Yeah, let's see. Amazon. Dick, S-T-O-L-K-E-N, I think. And it's so unknown that it's not even on there. I will find it. it S okay. S-T-O-K-E-N, maybe? Maybe. Did you find it, Tessa? Um, I see him in Wikipedia. Is he the member of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? No, I don't know. Maybe. Let's see, Dick Stoken book. Dick A. Stoken books. List of books by Dick A. Stoken. Strategic investment timing. That's oh, it. Strategic it. investment timing. And I've read it twice. Uh, it's and I read it many, many years ago the first time. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Tan. Perfect. Yeah. In case any of you uh, are interested, I do a live um, happy half hour. I call it. It's not a whole happy hour. It's just a happy half hour, and I, uh, I have <laughs> all kinds of traders. All kinds of traders get together and meet each other, exchange email addresses, talk about their trading, talk about uh, programming questions. I have Sam Tennis on there with me every time. I do it on the fourth of every month. So it's once a month. That way it shows up on different days of the week. Twice where I've had it on Saturdays. So on the fourth of every month, happy half hour. It's free. This means in two days, yes? In two days, yes. Perfect. Yeah. So just go to moneymentor.com and sign up. So I'll know to send you the invitation. I'll send you the link and we just all, we just all visit. And you make friends because there's, no, awesome, way, there's no way to network anymore. Yes. Yeah. We would like to also invite you to our happy hour, which is usually um, at the uh, last Friday of every month. Oh, cool. It'd be fun to have you there too. Thank you. I will do that. Okay, I, you, you promised this, Sandy. I, I, I listen to you. So you will do that. Do what? Oh, go to her. Go, go to come her. to our yeah. Yeah, happy yeah. hour. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I will. Perfect. So, Tessa, you heard. Yes, make notice. Yes. Tessa's going to send me a... <laughs> we recorded a... this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Tessa's going to send me a reminder. Perfect. Absolutely. Right. Great, I'll do it. Well, this was fun, Sunny. So next time yeah. you said, what are we covering next time again? Um, We're going to talk about how to make a million dollars. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Sunny, for uh, for Thank this you, um, nice there. education for, for us all. Absolutely. And thank you so yeah. much. Oh, I see it now on the slide. Okay. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you. Great. Have a nice Have day. Have a great day. Yep. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone.